Welcome to Final Element Methods. Today, during this tutorial, we're gonna solve the Final Element, uh, the Advanced Diffusion Equation for 1D models with the Final Element Method with the uh, special formulation, the isoparametric formulation. The conservation equation for 1D models of material of energy in a moving incompressible fluid uh, with linear relation between the diffusion and the variation of concentration of dilute of material um, is represented by the following equation. So let, let, let's put it here, right? So the conservation equation 1D models um, of material uh, in a moving fluid, incompressible fluid, with linear relation uh, between the diffusion and a, the variation of concentration of the dilute material which is uh, theta prime uh, for 1D models, the variation is only with respect to x, right? Is represented by this equation, where a is the is the um, cross section area, u is the velocity of the incompressible incompressible fluid incompressible fluid, theta prime is the variation um, is the variation of the concentration of the dilute material already mentioned it. and all of these is the attention term of the differential equation also known as a transport term. It's another name for this term. Right? The second term is the diffusion term. So we have the area, we have a constant, which is the diffusivity. And again, we have the variation. Um, we have the variation of the concentration of the dilute material, theta prime. Prime. So, as I said, all this term is a diffusion term of the equation. Minus S, where S is some external source, all right? It could be material, for example, external source of material. All right? Now, if this equation um, takes the following form. Let's, let's put it here too. If this equation takes the form the following form um, when it's applied a uh, so the, uh, this equation takes the following form. When the, this equation is applied for mass transport models,
for mass transpose models. Remember that we are only considering variation with respect to one of the, vari vari the, the variables, in this case is x, all right? And if we consider that this model is with constant area, with constant area and no external source of mass. The equation becomes, the above equation becomes this. U delta prime one second. Minus D, where D is the same K above, so it's a diffusivity term. And we have now this extra term here, which is, which is KR theta equal to zero. KR is the reaction rate that accounts for the reaction between the dilute material and its surroundings. So now that we have uh, this equation, we can, um, we can develop, we can develop a, uh, the weak form. But to do that, let's, let's see a special case. Let's apply this equation to this problem. So if we have a one dimensional aquifer, which, um, using a, which is model using a control laboratory experiment, the aquifer has constant area and length one meter and concentrated fluid moving through it. A chemical contaminant is measured to have a concentration of zero at X equals zero, which is our essential boundary condition in the problem. The contaminant reacts with its surroundings with a rate constant KR as it moves through the aquifer. It is known that the chemical substance will diffuse in the medium with a diffusion with known diffusion D and the flux of the material is also known at X equals one meter. So this is our natural boundary condition of the problem, all right? So the essential boundary condition is related to the primary variable, which is theta, which I said is the variation of concentration of the dilute material. Of the dilute material. And the natural boundary condition is, the, is related with the variation of theta, which is, which is uh, the, 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 related with the diffusion um, in the, in the, um, in the differential equation. So let's compute the steady state distribution of the chemical contaminant in the aquifer using two quadratic elements and isoparametric formulation. We're gonna assume that the velocity is constant, the velocity of the fluid is constant. All right, so once we have um, the equation in the differential equation of, of, of this, um, of this model, of this mass transport problem, we, we can develop the, weighted, the, the weak form by um, developing first the weighted residual and then, and then uh, uh, weaking, um, weaking this, um, this, 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 um, this equation. So, um, so let's develop Let's develop um, the the weighted residual. And the weak form. Uh, for for one general element, right?
So that's the, the first step. So for the element from xi to xj, we take the residual rx and we and which is uh, orthogonal with the weighted function dx, and we want to minimize that um, that product, that, 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 that normalization. All right, so it should be equal to zero. All right, so it means that what we have is, uh, this is i, the lower limit is i. So this product of R and the weighted uh, function V for the first term is UV delta prime, uh, theta prime. The second term will be D V theta double prime. And the third term would be KR V theta. We integrate this expression, that should be equal to zero. All right. So what we need to do now is to identify the, the, uh, what terms in the equation can be, uh, can, be, can be used to balance the derivatives. And we, can, and we only identify one term, which is the second one in this, in this in integral. So we identify this term. We want to balance the, the, the derivatives by integration by parts. Okay, so let's take this term. DD theta double prime dx and let's integrate it by parts. So we put them in one second. It's not clear. So we integrate the by parts uh, applying, by applying the technique that was learned. So we use the, we put them the way the function on the left, we put them the uh, theta double prime on the right. When V gains one derivative, theta double prime loses one. And now we, we have balanced the, the derivatives. So we can, we can stop there. And this term can be now represented in by the product of uh, a, by the product of a d d prime theta prime, and it goes inside the integral dx. I have a minus here, right? Minus that term plus the boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions are, the term for the boundary conditions is the product V theta prime. So this is the boundary conditions. Evaluated at xj minus xi. Evaluated at xj minus the term evaluated at xi. So if we put this term back in, in, our, in, our, in our original expression, what we got is the weak form in terms of theta and the weighted function V.
So we have the, inter the, the limits of the integral between xi and xj. The first term doesn't change. So it's just uv theta prime. The second term is the one that changes, right? So um, for this term, uh, it becomes positive. So that would be dv prime theta prime plus this third term doesn't change. So kr d theta. And that's what, that's, that's what that, uh, the integrand is. Now the boundary term. Um, that would be V, Q, I made um, a, a mistake up there. Let me, let, me, let me correct this because it's important. So here I miss the D, the diffusivity term. So let's, let's replace this um, term here. Okay. So we have B, theta a prime, right? And this is evaluated at x, j. And we have v, d, theta prime, and this is evaluated at x, um, i, right? This is what we have, right? So now a q in my, second, in, in, in my second equation is just the product d theta prime. So I'm just substituting by, by lowercase q. And the second term in the, uh, for the boundary condition would be VQ evaluated at X equals I. At XI, at XI. All right. So the next step now, this is the weak form. This is the weak form um, uh, for the genital element. Now we can select an approximation function and make the corresponding substitutions um, in the weak form. So in that case, if we select a quadratic function, let's select function. Um, as, a, as an the approximate function, we do that. It means that um, now we can substitute theta by theta tilde. And this is for each element, right? And this is a function of x. And this is the product between the vector containing the shape functions, since this is a quadratic element, we have three functions, three shape functions um, in this vector, and E. And the E is just the, the displacement vector. The derivative of theta tilde is equal, is represented by uh, the vector um, B, which, con which contains the derivatives of the shape functions and the E. We also have that we make the, the, the following substitution everywhere. Every time you see B, the weighted function, and we substitute it, we need to substitute it by the transpose of N. And every, every time you see D prime is substituted by D transpose. So if we do this, if we, if we apply, um, we apply these relations to the weak form, we can write now the weak form in terms of theta tilde, which is a function of X and the shape functions, which are also a function of x.
this is xj, right? So in matrix form, we can see that for each k function, n i and j and n k, which is which are the basis functions, sorry, which are the shape functions at each node of the element. we have the following uh, weak form of the problem. U n transpose B plus D, B transpose B plus KR n transpose n. Dx, this is all what is a function of X and we factor out D the displacement, the, 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 the vector D, right? D is, is a common factor on each of these terms. So we can factor out. And this is equal to uppercase Q, which is the forcing vector, right? So Q is a vector containing the natural boundary conditions. So at this point, we have enforced, we have imposed the essential and the natural boundary conditions. So that's why, let me finish this here. Right, that's why we, we were able to go from dq at x equals j to qj, right? Because d evaluated at xj is equal to one, right? Uh, that the Kronecker delta property apply to d. And d evaluated at xi is equal to one. So that's why it ended up being in minus ki, all right? So this is the weak form of the problem. The next step is to develop the isoparametric formulation. The way we do that is by substituting, by making the substitution of X in terms of the natural coordinates. So let's do it in the next page. Um, let me rewrite the, 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 the previous um, equation here. So we have xi, xj, u n transpose b plus d, b transpose b plus kr, n transpose n. Dx, d, equal to Q. So that's what we have. Now, if we develop the isoparametric formulation, so to develop the isoparametric formulation of the problem, all we need to do is to remember um, these relations. So now we have this, the, the physical coordinates are X, right? Which we can be also known as the coordinate in the global domain. And the natural coordinates uh, would be a uh, uh, psi, which are also the local domain, right? So, um, so let's see that if X um, it's a function of the coordinate psi. The way to go to the uh, physical coordinates is by the same shape functions. But this shape function will be a function of, of, of the natural coordinate, which is psi, right? 
the derivative for x um, or the dx, sorry, the dx is the product between the Jacobian and this, this side. Well, remember that the Jacobian contains all the, geometric, the geometrical information. The Jacobian is B bar XE can be written in this way, where B bar contains the derivatives of the shape functions and, and remember that now these shape functions are a function of psi of the, of the natural coordinate. And um, B B bar over J E, which is the which is the Jacobian. Um, give me. All right, so B bar, B bar um, are the derivatives. Um, now, let me put in this term. Yeah, 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 B bar would be the derivative of each shape function, which is a function of psi with respect to psi, right? This is B bar. So this is a vector containing this. Uh, now we have, with respect to the, to the second, uh, the derivative of the second check function, which is at the node K with respect to psi and now the derivative of the shape function at the third node, which is a partial of n j with respect to psi. Right. Now, if we want to substitute b, which is a function of x, in terms of a, a by some function, which is a function of psi, we need to use the Jacobian. That's pretty much what we need to do. So in this equation, we're going to start making substitutions. And every time we see B, we will substitute B by B bar over the Jacobian. So remember that the Jacobian contains the geometrical information of the problem. All right? So, uh, so that's what is B bar. Okay, so now that the, we define these relations, we can get back to the equation about this one here, and we can start making the corresponding substitutions. So now we are in the local domain defined by natural coordinates. So our limits now go from minus one to one, all right? The first term, let's start with the first term. So the first term we have the velocity u, we have a transpose. So a transpose would be the shape, the same shape function. So it's just, it's just n transpose, right? We have now b, but we said that b is written as b bar over the Jacobian for the element, right? So it means that we have B bar times the Jacobian for the element. Let's put now as a subscript the element. And this is the inverse, right? Of the Jacobian. Plus the second term, B, 
B transpose. What is B transpose? Again, it's a transpose of B bar over the Jacobian. So it would be um, B bar transpose Jacobian minus one. All right, now what is B? B bar times the Jacobian of the element to the power of minus one, the inverse, right, of the Jacobian. Now let's move to the third term. So we're now going in this term, plus KR, N transpose, it's just N transpose, right? And N is just N, okay? So now we are in the local domain, right? So everything is in terms of natural coordinates. So this dx becomes g of the Jacobian, sorry, uh, the Jacobian times this side, okay? All right. Um, the only thing that is left is D, so we can put D here outside. And all of this is equal to the force vector Q. Okay, reviewing this equation, um, um, we found out that um, they, there is a, this is a B bar, right? I, I need to, to put the bar on top of B for the first term. All right, so now we're ready. So this is the formulation, the isoparametric formulation of the weak form. And this isoparametric formulation, it's, um, it's the one we need to solve for um, or is, actually, let me let, let me take it back. So let's move this again. So what we have here is this is all the stiffness of the element. This is the stiffness matrix. Stiffness matrix of the element. In isoparametric formulation, D is are the displacements to solve for, and this is the forcing vector of the element or the force vector. All right. So to solve this integral, instead of using Mathematica or any other medium to solve it, we're gonna use a, a numerical integration and, and a special technique, um, which is called uh, the Gauss quadrature. So to solve the, 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 the integral, we're gonna use Gauss quadrature, we're gonna use uh, the two points rule. So, uh, for the two for the two points uh, the two points uh, rule of the Gauss quadrature, we solve the integral and we evaluate the uh, we solve the integral or or we evaluate the integral at two points. One point is um, minus the square root of one third, and the other point is the positive of the square root of uh, one third, and the weight. So these are, those are the quadrature points. Let me change this here. So let's put in these terms. So to solve the integral, to solve the integral, uh, 
we're going to use numerical integration. Gauss quadrature. That's the method we're going to use. And for gas quadrature, we're going to use uh, the two points rule. So it means that the two points to evaluate the integrand are minus and plus the square root of one third. And the weight is equal to one. All right? So this is what we're going to do. All right, so um, to get a better understanding of the script uh, in Mathematica, let's see, let's talk a little bit about the size of this, um, of the matrices uh, in this, uh, in, the, in, in the integral, all right? So since this is a quadratic element, since this is a quadratic element, the size of the, of N transpose, the size of N is, um, one by three, right? So let's let's get back here. So the size of n is one by three. All right. So it means that the size of a transpose is three by one, right? Now, um, what is what is the size of b? So we know that the size of b is also one by three. because um, B contains the derivatives of the shape functions as a function of X, right? So, um, so, 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 so this is one by, one by three as well, right? So it means that the size of B, trans, of B bar is uh, one by three, okay? So it means that the, the, the product the dot product between n transpose and b bar for the first term of the stiffness of the integrand would be a matrix three by three. Again, this is because of the quadratic element we shows um, at the beginning. All right. Now, remember that b. Is a function of x. So if we go to the equation above here. B, all of this is a function of x. You can see the differential here is the x. So all the integrand is a function of x, right? All is a function of x. Now we're using the same shape functions in this uh, in this line here as the ones in the uh, as a function of x. But instead of x, now we have psi, right? So the shape functions now are, are, are a function of psi, which is the natural coordinate. So to go here, we need to take the derivative, we need to, to take the derivative of these shape functions. And the derivative of this, those shape functions needs to be as a function of psi. But we have b, which is a function of x. So at same as we use the Jacobian to go from the natural coordinates to the physical coordinates or vice versa, we can use the Jacobian information to go from the derivative of the shape functions in X to the derivatives of the shape functions in the natural coordinates side. So that's why B bar, um, that, that's how we can write B in terms of B bar, where B bar is a function of psi. All right? Okay. So let's, let's keep moving to the, to the second term now. So we have that B transpose, B bar transpose. Um, that would be a matrix um, one by three, uh, sorry, three by one. 
the Jacobian is the Jacobian is 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 a value. It's, it's, it's not a matrix. It's not a vector. B, the size of B is um one by three. So again, for the second term, we have a matrix which is three by three. And looking at the third term, we can see that uh, n transpose is three by one, and n is one by three. So now we have a third term, which is three by three. So each term in this integral is a matrix three by three. Okay, so the integral would be a matrix three by three, right? Finally, you remember that this Q is a vector, uh, which is um, a three by one. I use this script to solve the, 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 the problem, right? Uh, we said that we have two, two quadratic elements. For one of the elements, for one of the elements, the middle node is not in the center. So it's move, it's off uh, from the center of the element. In the, uh, um, the physical coordinates, right? In the global domain. Right? For the second element, we have three nodes, and the middle node is in the center of the element. Right? So we have two quadratic elements, right? The subparametric shape functions are this, where P is representing the variable, the, 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 the natural coordinate side. All right? So we can see um, now that the evaluation of the Jacobian gives two different values for them, for them, for uh, two different values for the elements. It's not the same value because we don't have, for the first element, the middle node is not in the center, it's offset, right? So now, we can see that there is different. There is a difference between the two Jacobians. If there was a case uh, that the, the middle node for the first element uh, would, uh, if it's the case that the, the the middle node for the first element is in the center, both Jacobians J1 and J2 would be one over four for this quadratic element. All right. So the integrand, now we, we move to solve, to find the stiffness matrix for, um, for the elements. So actually this is not for element one, this is in general for the elements. So the integral, so, so the integrand, the integrand for the first, for the first element is made of three terms, u, n transpose, b bar over the Jacobian. The second term is d, the diffusivity term, um, transpose of b bar, b bar, and the Jacobian uh, over the Jacobian to the square. And the second term is kr, n transpose, n. And all of this is multiplied by the Jacobian from the when we go when, from 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 the when we go from dx to this side, we have that dx is the Jacobian times this side, right? So this this last Jacobian is is it's just that. All right. The only difference between the integral one and the integral two is the Jacobian. So that's that's the beauty of the of the, of, of the method of the of the isoparametric formulation. You can see that up to this point. Everything is the same for the elements, except for the Jacobians. And even inside the integrand, for each element, if um, if um, the, um, um, there was not for the Jacobian, it would be exactly the same. So remember that the Jacobian is containing the um, geometrical information. We want to solve the integral by numerical methods. So we're using the Gauss quadratic. We're using uh, two points 
scholarship, uh, Gauss scholarship point, two points. The rule is two points. So the two points are minus and positive a square root of one third. And the weights for um, the weight is only one. Yeah, we have only one one uh, one value for the for the weight. Okay, so the way to solve this um, integral by Gauss quadrature is through the evaluation of the integrand at each Gauss quadrature point. This is exactly what I do here uh, up to this point. Multiply by the weight, and the weight is QW1, which is one, right? The second term is the evaluate of the of this integral is the evaluation of the integrand at the second quadrature point, which is QP2, multiply by the weight QW2. Now we can see that the stiffness matrices for element K, K for the for the first element and the second element, so first element and second element are different. Again, if the element, if the, if, if the middle node for the first element um, wouldn't be, would, would, uh, wouldn't be um, offset from the center, these two would be the same because the Jacobian is the same. So the, the stiffness matrices for both elements would be the same, right? So now what we do is we bring, um, we use the, 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 the element code to formulate the global stiffness matrix and the global force term, the vector to solve this system of equations for theta, which is represented by T in this script. So from this system of equations, what we're uh, solving this system of equations is um, or, um, or the product of K times D equals Q is just solving uh, um, four equations. So the first equation um, contain information or um, is a contain, a, only have two terms. Why? Because the essential boundary condition of the problem happens at, at theta at x equals zero. So there is no contribution of that term in the first equation. The second equation contains the couple terms. So you can see that we have um, components from K1 and K2. The third equation and the fourth equation only, only, only have components from K2 and from, from the second element. So in this line, we apply, uh, we, um, we solve for this system of equations, right? And in the global, the global force vector, it's um, four by one, where all the components, all the all the components of the force vector, are zero except the last component, which is the natural boundary condition applied to the last node of the model. So that's why we have Q bar here. So the the last equation is equal to Q bar, and Q bar is is just the the, the, the value for the natural boundary condition. If we compare the solution uh, by use, uh, from finite element, by using two quadratic elements and the isoparametric formulation, the solutions at each node uh, with, a, with, with a small error, match the, 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 the evaluation of the exact solution at those points. You can see that. So the first contains are the solutions from the finite element method, and the, seg and the second one is the exact solution evaluated at the, note, at, at, at the notes. All right, so after proving that the, uh, the solution by using um, 
The final element method with two quadratic elements and the isoparametric formulation uh, shows good agreement um, for, um, with, um, with, the, with the evaluation of the exact solution at the location of the nodes when the first element or the node in the, in, inside the first element was offset from the, from, from the center. Uh, we ran the second case um, to see the, 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 the output or the result of evaluating um, this problem by moving the middle node or the node uh, in, in, in the inside of the first element to the middle of the element, to the center of the element. And the results are here. So you can see now that um, uh, the solution from finite element even agrees much better um, to the evaluation of the exact solution uh, at, um, at the nodes. All right? So um, with this, uh, we conclude um, this tutorial. Thank you.